Praise the Lord, everybody. So good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, it's always good to be in the house of the Lord. But there are some moments is just better than others. And uh, this has got to be one of those moments. It's good, but this is better than others. And this is the first time that I have seen the building with the pews. I saw them putting the carpet down. I saw a lot of the colors. I have been impressed by the structure of this as it has been ongoing for a long time now. But tonight is the best sight yet because it's full of people. Thank God. And that's what it's all about. Thank God, thank God. And that this structure has been erected for the name of Jesus Christ and His gospel, of which there is no other. Hallelujah. And that He is a holy God and He's going to have a holy people. This, this is a monument to what God will do for those that honor his name and honor his truth. So at any rate, I count it a tremendously high honor to be here. I told Brother Alviar before service, I said, Brother Alviar, I'm the first speaker, and I'm going to be the most uh, careful first speaker that you've probably ever had before you, and I, and I want to do that. I intend to do that. So uh, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. Thank you, Brother Holmes. Thank you, Sister Holmes, the Holmes family. Thank you, Church of North Little Rock, First Pentecostal Church, for your untold sacrifice and labor of love to see this come to this place. Thank you for hosting this camp meeting. And I thank Jesus Christ that he knows how to do it all. How many are glad you're part of the church tonight? Oh, it means everything in the world. Everything in the world. I want to say God bless all of our ministerial brethren that are here tonight. We so do appreciate you. And uh, good to see Brother Burr. God bless you, Brother Burr. Good to see you. And all these other brethren love and appreciate you so much. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning with verse number 13. Hebrews 11, beginning with verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them far off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly country. And then I think the next words are the most important of all. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. 
Let's ask that God would touch our hearts in his word tonight. Lord, we love you. We are very mindful of your presence. We ask God that you would anoint our hearts and minds to receive your gracious word. We love you. We stand in awe of you. Lord Jesus, we commit this service and our hearts into your hands. Let the will of God, the perfect, perfect will of God be done in this house, at this time, right now in Jesus' name. God bless you so very, very much. You may be seated. Now, this message that I'm going to preach tonight, I'm going to, there's three phases of this, but they're going to be short phases. I may take more time telling you how I got this message. This is one of those rare times where I'm committed to another man. His name is O.C. Marler, and he is committed to me that when I preach this, I have to give him credit, and when he preaches it, he has to give me credit. Because we came up with this together, uh, the main part of it. And where we got this, we were at a uh, camp meeting last week, and uh, Brother Nathaniel Wilson was preaching, he was teaching, but he was, God love him, he was rambling, and uh, it was good ramble, good rambling, very good. And I may ramble before I get out of here. Hallelujah. But in the process of his rambling, he was talking about a book that had been written by a man by the name of E. Calvin Beisner. And it was an anti-us book. And a portion of the book dealt with he, he had a little chapter of page in there, something on how to witness to oneness Pentecostals and get them out of what they were in. And it was pretty inane, ignorant stuff that he, his whole book was inane and ignorant. But at any rate, his suggestions were pretty inane. I think many of our kids that are in good Sunday school classes could turn most of those guys inside out. But while uh, Brother Wilson was talking about that, um, Brother Marler and I began to compile our own list based on my 30 years of experience in the ministry, his 40 years of experience. And between 70 combined years of experience, we have seen some ways that uh, people get out. Things that have messed them up. Now, some of what I have to say tonight, I'm going to be saying tongue in cheek. A little bit of humor, I think. But there's enough element of truth in it that it's painful sometimes. And uh, some of the things that I will talk about, I think those that are in the ministry here tonight can probably relate to some of it a little better than others simply because of their years of experience. But first of all, uh, the main reason that Mr. Beisner and company would like for us to get out of this is that they think that we are in a very erroneous doctrine. And chief of which, they, they take exception with much that we preach and teach, but chief that they struggle with is the fact that we do not believe that there are three gods. Nor do we believe that there are three persons in a triune Godhead. And they think that that is heresy. Well, like the Apostle Paul said after the way which is called heresy, so worship I the God of our fathers. Hallelujah. Amen. And so I'd like to... First of all, just remind us a little bit tonight that the bottom line bedrock of this church is based on the fact that there is one God and we know his name. Hallelujah. 
and we've got good company. Amen. Mr. Beisner does not appreciate it, but he will in time to come. That we have good company that believe in God exactly like we do. One of them is the patriarch David, who in 2 Samuel 7, 22 said, Wherefore, thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee. According to all that we have heard with our ears. Can I tell you, David knew that there was one God and that there was no God to his left and there was no God to his right. There was none God beside him. He knew that Moses had it right. Amen. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, when he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hallelujah. Amen. Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. And any time you see L-O-R-D in all caps in your Old Testament, that is the Tetragrammaton, and that is Jehovah. That literally means Jehovah. That's what the King James translators did with that now lost pronounceable word. You are my witnesses, saith the Jehovah, and my servant. He's speaking of Israel, whom I have chosen. That you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Amen. Before me there was no God formed. Neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me there is no Savior. There is no Savior to his left. There is no Savior to his right. Hallelujah. 44, 6 and 8. Thus saith the Jehovah, the King of Israel... And his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. He is not only Israel's King, he is Israel's Redeemer. Hallelujah. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Hallelujah. And we could go on and on and on. But the beauty of what we believe is that this God, this great God, this God who could not bleed, this God that tempts no man, neither indeed can be tempted, this God that cannot die, This God that is not flesh. This God who is a spirit. Hallelujah. This God who is invisible. One day so desired to save the likes of you and I. Amen. That this invisible God overshadowed a little virgin girl by the name of Mary. And in her womb and through her. He brought forth human flesh. Hallelujah. And unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I'm glad John 1 and 10. He was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to wit. God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. First Timothy 3.16 without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. Justified in the spirit. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received up in the glory. And that's the God we serve. His name is Jesus. Jesus saith unto him, John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. If you'd have known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him, and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And he said, have I been so long time with you, Philip, and thou hast not known me, he that has seen me. If you've seen me, You've seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Don't you know that the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. I'm glad I know his name. That's why we baptize in his name. That's why these people were baptized in his name. So basically, fundamentally, that is what Mr. Beisner wants us out of. Is out of that. He does not like our holiness. He does not like our entrenchments that this gospel, that there is none other, that in this name neither is there salvation in any other. 
For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, et cetera, et cetera. And so he had his list of how to witness to people like you and I. Well, Brother Marler and I, we compiled our own list while Brother Wilson rambled. Hallelujah. So I'm going to give it to you. It's a short list. It's ten points. And again, some of this is tongue-in-cheek, and some of this may not necessarily apply. But overall, generally speaking, looking even from a distance, and especially from the ministerial aspect, I've watched this happen. Number one, the way to get a one God, Jesus name, apostolic, out of their church. Attack their social status. Because some of us seem to want social acceptance so bad. And if you just attack their social status, oh, that's your people. They're going to have a hard time doing that in Little Rock. Hallelujah. That I, I grant you. They, there was a day you guys were on the wrong side of the tracks, but now you own the tracks. Hallelujah. But Pentecostals, they are so susceptible to that business. I'm going to tell you something. We don't got to take a back seat to nothing or nobody. Amen. Number two, offer them some attention. This is kind of a spinoff of number one. Offer them some attention by a politician or offer them a ride in a limousine with a dignitary. That's if you want to get them out of the truth. Number three, compare them with the Amish. Compare them with the Amish. Make fun of their holiness. Number four, have someone hurt their feelings, especially from within. And especially... Make it the pastor. And if you really want to go for the juggler, hurt the feelings of their children. That's if you want people to pack up and leave a one God, Jesus name, apostolic church. Hurt their feelings. Let somebody within hurt their feelings. Let the pastor hurt their feelings or hurt the itty bitty feelings of their children. Oh. God help, don't ever touch your grandchildren. I need to, I need to add that to my list. I ain't got my pen on there. I won't give you, I won't give you credit for that, but I, I gotta add that on there. That's too good to pass. Stick with me, brother Alviar. We're hanging in there, brother. I don't wanna, I don't wanna ramble, but I don't wanna miss that either. <laughs> got a friend of mine, he could not be here. There was a death in his church, but, Brother Miles Young told me this the other day that a lady in his church in Oakland was going down the street, passing out tracks, talking to people. There was a lady leaning up in a corner of a building. She was an obvious derelict. Her clothes were in tatters. The scars of sin were on her face. She reeked of alcohol. Her eyes were bloodshot. And the lady came up and began to witness to her and talk to her. And the man, the woman that was in such pitiful condition, she said, you're Jesus' name, aren't you? And she said, yes. She said, you're holiness, aren't you? Yes. You believe there's just one God, don't you? She said, yes. How do you know all of that? She said, because I used to be in Von Morton's church. And she told her her name. And Brother Young called Brother Morton, called the woman's name. He said, Miles, she was one of the best women that I ever pastored in my life. She was a Sunday school teacher. She was a builder. She was a worker. She loved God. Said, one day, I pastored her for years. 
I had to correct her teenage son. And a little root of bitterness got inside of her because I had to corral her teenage son. And now the boy is not in church and the mother's a derelict in the streets of Oakland. Oh God, deliver us. Somewhere, it's still true. Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. We need to let the pastor be the pastor. Preach to me, brother. Preach to my babies. Preach to my grandchildren. We gotta be saved. Number five, ways to get them out of the truth. Give them a music contract or offer them to sing with someone famous. Number six, deny them an office or vote or take them out of an office or sometimes even put them into an office. or position, or job, or whatever. When are we going to grow up? Hallelujah. Number seven. Bless them with so much money they can no longer afford to pay their tithes. Like the one man I knew of, That when God found him and put him in church, his tithes, when he started paying him, was $5 a week. But he never missed. And he never missed. And then he learned the art of giving and offerings. And then time went on and God blessed him and God blessed him and God blessed him. And when he came to the place that his tithes were $500 a week, he asked for a meeting with his pastor And he leaned across the desk and said, I can't afford to pay that. So the pastor leaned back across the desk and said, well, I'll tell you what. Let's pray that God takes your income back down to where you can afford to pay it. Number eight. Let their children become teenagers, and desire to live an unseparated lifestyle. And that may happen, but that don't mean you got to take up for them. And that doesn't mean you change your message in midstream. You set your face and say, I'm sorry, these are the rules of the house. I love you. I appreciate you. We'll do the best we can. But I'm not changing. And our church is not changing. We're going to live for God. God forbid to be like one pastor that I know of. That his daughter was in the choir. And she came to the place she wanted to start cutting her hair. And he said, you will not be in our choir. So she went to every woman in that large choir. And she said, if we all do it together, he'll buckle. And one night, every one of them showed up with their hair cut. He should have kicked every one last, last one of them, and he buckled, and he never opened his mouth. And today, they're not even preaching baptism in Jesus' name. Can I tell you something? Somewhere. Woo. We got phase three. Well, it'll get better. Number nine. The best way is to offer them a God that will make no demands. By way of a loose, unfaithful, unbelieving, worldly church. And number ten, the very best way 
is to get them a high charisma Balaam type pastor who will show them how to do it. That's the best ways to get people out. However, oh, and by the way, and when people end up in that mess and they want to get out of it and they want to go back to the roots and they want to go back to where Jesus is still God and we still baptize in Jesus' name and we still believe in holiness and separation from the world, woe be to the pastor that lets him come to their church. Some things we don't need to elaborate. Hallelujah. But I'm going to tell you this much. We're all going to face God, brethren. And I don't think good people should be punished for wanting to live right. So phase three. However, somewhere, someplace, some all times, God is going to have a people, hallelujah, that will pay any price, that will suffer any hardship, that will bear any indignity, that will stand any blessing or any curse. They've made up their mind, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to go to the house of God. I'm going to be faithful. I'm not getting out of this one God, Jesus name, apostolic way. It's the best way. It's the only way. It's the right way. It's the real way. You can't chase me off. You can't run me off. You can't hurt my feelings bad enough. There's not enough money in the world. I want to live for God. They're going to love the standards. They're going to love their pastor. They're going to love the truth. They're going to love everything about it. If their name is Joseph and they have to overcome envy, false brethren, rejection, temptation, being lied about or forgotten, so be it. You cannot chase me out of this. I'm going to live for God. If their name is Paul and they receive five stripes, five times 40 stripes, save one, three times you beat him with rods, three times they're in a shipwreck, amen, a day and a night they spend in the deep, they're in journeys and perils of waters and robbers and countrymen and false brethren and heroes and city and all of these things, they made up their mind, I will live for God. I know whom I have believed. If your name is David, and it's lions and bears and giants and older brothers, and you've been lied about and betrayals and your own failures and dispirited and disappointed, but something says, you cannot run me out of Dodge. I am in this church to stay. If your name is Job and they lose all finance and lose their family and lose their health and lose their friends and lose the goodwill of their life, of their wife, and they lose the feeling of the presence of God, yet, hallelujah, there's something inside that says, I have nowhere else to go. There is no other God. There is no other truth. This is where I stand. If he kills me, I'm still going to be here. Let me tell you, there's still people that have made up their mind. I'm going to live for God. Well, we got a, there's a teenage girl. I told this up at Brother King's camp meeting. And this girl and her mama, they moved down to our area two and a half, three years ago. So God knows they came from good stock. But this girl, and I didn't even know she was in ROTC. She's in a public high school. She's in our TC. I did not know she had a 4.0 grade average. Nor did I know that one day they came to her and said, Okay, okay, Naomi. We've let you wear your skirts, your dresses all this time. But we're going on a tour. And we're going to be doing some parades and stuff. And said, no more of these skirts business you got to wear pants like the rest of the girls. And Naomi said, I won't do it. (laughs) 
So they called her back in. He said, now, Naomi, this is what's going to happen. We want a meeting with your family, your mom and dad. Dad's not even in church. And your pastor. She said, that's fine if you want. She said, but it doesn't have anything to do with them. This is my conviction, and I'm not changing. And they said, Naomi, if you don't, you're not going on the trip. She said, fine. I understand. That's no problem. I won't go. They called her back in. They said, if you don't go and wear those pants, we're kicking you out of ROTC. She said, that's fine. Whatever you got to do, that's cool. I'm not going to wear them. They called her back in. They said, Naomi, not only will we kick you out, you'll lose all your credits. She said, that's fine. Whatever you got to do. I understand. It's no problem. They said, look, we're going to the upper apps. The authorities on this. She said, that's fine. Whatever you got to do, that's cool. And they talked to all of her teachers. And they called her back in. They said, Naomi, we've talked to the authorities. And we've talked to your teachers and all of the other girls in this troop have come and talked to us. This is the new edict. You can go on the trip. Furthermore, as long as you are in ROTC, every girl in this unit has said they will wear nothing but dresses every day. Somebody's going to live for God. Somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to say, hey, I'm in this for the long haul. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril? As it is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And all of these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels or principalities or powers or things present or things to come or height or depth or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. I'm not done. Got a good man in our church. He used to live in Texas. He used to work and had a high job in a quite a corporation. He had a lot of stock in that company. And they offered him a position if he'd come back to go back to work for him. It was a tremendous pay raise. And uh, he came to me about it. I said, Joe, I'm just going to tell you this. You need to pray about it. You need to pray about it. And if you go back there, whatever you do, you know. If you go back there, you've got to find a good church to go to. You've got to find a good church. He said, I know that. I know that. He went back there. They offered him the moon. He came back. He prayed some more. He walked into my office. He put a check down on the desk. I said, what's this? He said, it's for the building fund. I said, I looked, I said, whoa, we're, 
whoa, 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 whoa. He said, I sold all my stock in the company. That's the check. I'm not going back. I'm staying here. Since that time where he works, they have raised him and raised him and raised him and raised him. But you know the name of the company that he was, they offered him the money and the stock that he sold? Enron. Hey, brother, walk with God. It's going to be all right. Do what God wants you to do. It's going to be okay. Everybody stand. Musicians, come. Brother, how long you been in church? 34 years. 30 years. Have you ever had your feelings hurt in 30 years? Well, if you didn't, I want to know where you went to church. Hallelujah. How long you been in church, brother? Six years. Have you ever? Yeah. How long have you been in church? I don't want to get technical here. Have you ever made a mistake in 21 years? More than one. Have you ever kind of blowed it some way and had to go to the altar and pray? But you're still here. And it didn't take you out. Because you wanted this worse than you wanted anything in the world. You are in the church, right? Okay, I will make sure. How long have you been in? All your life. Have you ever had your feelings hurt? You're young. You're strong. Do you go to public school? Has the coaches ever come to work on you about being in sports and stuff or your buddies? But you're here. Well, why, why, why is that? Can I tell you, in the year 2004, there are still people. God is not ashamed to be called their God. David lived for me. Joseph lived for me. Abraham lived for me. And in 2004, there are still people in America, Babylon. They're going to live for me. And I'm not ashamed to be called their God. They'll walk with me. They'll talk with me. They'll stand in the face of opposition. They're not going to pull them out. Let's lift our hands and determine we're going to be of that number in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's tell him all over. Tell him all over. Lord, we've got our mind made up. Why don't you shake your right fist at the devil tonight? Tell him all over again. I've got my mind made up. I've got my foot on the rock. You're not going to turn me around, devil. Ah, uh, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. I'm going to live for you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just go back again. Amen. When the devil says don't go, just go back again. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God for big people in church. Amen. Little people get jealous. Big people work together, don't they? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.